Greetings to all of you. It's a real joy to meet with you brothers and sisters uh, around the world, united in faith and in purpose. And the word that the Lord has blessed me and encouraged me with is in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 speaks of numerous things, but I would like to focus in on two things. First of all, he tells us we have been given or born again to a living hope in verse 3. Let's read verse 3 and verse 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we bless him? Who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope. There it is, a living hope. Notice it's not a future hope. It's not a past hope. It's a living hope. A hope that is alive each moment of our life. That's what we're born again or born into in Jesus Christ. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To obtain, that means we receive from our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We receive an inheritance which is imperishable will never fade away. Imperishable. That's an amazing, amazing statement. It's, it's an unearthly statement. Everything on this earth passes away. We know that in life, even every day we live passes away. And we never live that day again. Moments in life. Seasons in life, they pass away. Think about the years of our life. It passes away, and we never get to live that year again at that age. But this, this living hope does not pass away. It's imperishable and undefiled. Everything in this life becomes defiled. The Lord often reminds me when I get dirty or muddy on a rainy day uh, or things get dirty and in, in, in a sense defiled, that I'm made of dirt. So, of course, I get muddy because we're created from dirt. But what we're born into? When we're born again, is not made from dirt. Jesus Christ is incarnate flesh, born of the Spirit of God, not of earthy man, as he tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that first the first Adam was born of the earth, earthy. And in Genesis, we see how God created us. From the earth, he created Adam from the earth. But Jesus was not created of the seed of man. He was not created from the earthy. He was brought into this life through the spirit of God, even though he dwelt eternally with the father, even before he was born into a physical body. So here we have Jesus who is completely undefiled by the earth and anything from the earth, sin in particular. Now we're born into this inheritance that is, first of all, imperishable. It's undefiled. It will not fade away. Anything that we know in this life fades. Grass fades. Flowers fade. Um, Fruit trees fade and fruit eventually rots or uh, 
we, our physical bodies begin to fade and we get gray hair, we lose our hair like Conrad and others. <laughs> but I did notice I like the hair on his chin. That's good, Conrad. Even though I shaved mine, I just thought it was neat. Uh, so sometimes we grow new hair on some different places, I guess. But it, 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 the point is, everything fades away that we know in this life. But we're born into a life in Jesus Christ that never fades away. And this, this new birth that is born within us, that raises up our spirit into this resurrection life in a relationship with the Father, as it tells us in Ephesians mm -hmm. chapter 2, it does not fade away. Mm -hmm. And if we continue to nurture and feed uh, on this life of Jesus Christ, it will never fade away in our hearts and in our minds. And that love does not need to grow cold. And that relationship does not need to fade away. It's an inheritance imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God. So why doesn't it fade away? How is it imperishable? How is it reserved in heaven for us? Because it's protected by God himself. And this word so encouraged me, my dear brothers and sisters. So often I have thought of my Christian life and my relationship with God as something that I must maintain so that it continues to grow. And there is a truth to that, right? We must continue to grow in Christ. I must continue to expose myself to the life of Jesus Christ in his word and through prayer, drawing near to God. But that's not how it's protected. God himself protects this spiritual life within me. Isn't that wonderful? That blessed the socks off of me this morning again as I thought about that truth. It's, yes, it does require obedience from me, but that's not how it's protected. God himself began this good work in us, and he protects it and continues to feed it and build it up. As he tells us in Philippians chapter 1, he that began a good work in you will also accomplish it, perfect it, until the day of Jesus Christ. And and uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says that, you know, the Corinthian church had a problem. They were following men. Some were saying, I'm of Apollos. Others were saying, I'm of Peter. Others were saying, I'm of Paul. And so there was a division in the church because they were following men. But Paul, through the Holy Spirit, said an amazing truth. He said it this way. I'll turn my Bible to it. You can turn with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says in verse 3, For you are still fleshly or carnal, or since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? And then he says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing growth. For so then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. So we see God causes the growth. We're born into this imperishable inheritance that doesn't come from the earth. It's, not unde it's undefiled. It doesn't fade away. And it's reserved because God protects it through his power 
verse 5 of 1 Peter 1, through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. There is much of this salvation that is yet to be revealed to you and I, to his children. And again, I think of the word in 1 Corinthians, I think it is in chapter 2, where Paul says that eye hasn't seen and ear hasn't heard all of the things that God has prepared for those who love him. But they are revealed to us by the Spirit. And so this, this revelation of the Spirit, I was um, much encouraged this morning because even though the word that I'm sharing with you here in 1 Peter chapter 1 was written for, what, over 2,000 years ago, many people have read these words. I read them, I don't know, hundreds of times in my life. You probably have as well. But when I knelt before the Lord this morning and read this first chapter, there was a new revelation the Lord gave me. This beautiful truth was revealed to me in a fresh, in a living way. And it, it boosted, it encouraged me. There was growth, spiritual growth of encouragement in my heart and in my mind. And I went out of my office greatly rejoicing. Verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. And indeed, that's where we're at, right? Many of us have numerous trials that can distress us. And the whole world is being distressed by this trial of isolation because of the virus. Yet, God's people have a unique rejoicing because they have a living hope. It's not a hope that the virus is cured. It's not a hope that, though we hope that they do find a cure and this too shall pass away, that's not where our joy is because that's not a living hope. That's a passing away hope. As soon as it's gone, the hope's gone. But our hope is greater than that. Remember? It is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved, not on the earth, but in heaven for us. So this brings great rejoicing in verse 6, even though we walk through the various trials. That the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. And so we see this living hope is anchored in Jesus Christ, through him revealing himself to us. <laughs> You're waving at Michael's teddy bear. That's hilarious. Anyway, so what should we do with this living hope? God causes it to grow in our hearts. But notice, we do have a part to play in this living hope. Verse 13. Therefore, gird your minds for action. We're not to just sit around idly rejoicing in something that's reserved in heaven for us. No, this living hope spurs us into action. It provokes us into action. It inspires us not only to rejoice, but to act. Keep sober in spirit. Act number one, keep sober in spirit. And he tells us this word sober, we're exhorted to be sober numerous times throughout the scriptures. And it's a, it's a word not of a serious, a serious face kind of soberness, but it's a soberness, notice, in spirit. It's a spirit that is fixed upon a goal. That's how I see this. 
The sober spirit in Ephesians chapter 5 tells us to be sober-minded and not drunk. And so we, we see that drunkenness takes this sober spirit away. This spirit, as I um, like to think of it in Ephesians chapter 5, he tells us to walk soberly or circumspectly is another English word that the King James uses, which is to be sober-minded. But I like to think of it this way. It's simply to be a, a fixed goal. My spirit has a fixed goal, and that fixed goal is Jesus Christ. Is your goal fixed on Jesus? Notice, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that fixed hope, that sober-mindedness, sober in spirit, fixes our hope. And this is the outcome. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves. Be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because as it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And that word heard, holy, we've heard many times, many of us, is the word clean. Be clean. Remember, we're called into this living hope that is undefiled. How does it remain undefiled? In my personal life, it continues to cleanse me and clean me as I walk in obedience to this living hope. And as it's revealed to me, as Jesus reveals himself to me, my obedience to that revelation cleanses me. I think of Paul when he stood before King Agrippa. Remember his testimony that he gave before the king? And he reflected back on his new birth experience and how God arrested his attention on the road to Damascus. And he made these beautiful, he said these beautiful words. It's found in Acts. I'm going to turn to it real quickly. Um, I think it's in Acts. Let me just find it for you. Acts chapter 25. Uh, actually, in chapter 26, he's before a King Agrippa, and he says these words in verse 19. Consequently, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. And so his life's testimony was one of obedience to the revelation of Jesus Christ. When Christ was revealed to him, he cleansed his life. Because he continued to obey, was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. So I want to encourage you with that. That's our part, is simply continuing to walk as obedient children in the revelation that Christ gives to us through his word. And uh, verse 17, and if you address as father, the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay upon the earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished, spotless the blood of Christ. Now, and again, also encourage you, each one of you, my dear brothers and sisters, with this word, the reason it is undefiled and remains undefiled is because the blood of Christ is undefiled. Remember, he came to the earth, not from earthy man, but he came undefiled into a human body. And he remained sinless, undefiled. And now, his blood remains undefiled. And so it's not our acts of obedience that necessarily keep us clean. Yes, that act of obedience leads us 
into a closer relationship and does have a cleansing effect on us. But it's the reason we remain undefiled is because the blood of Christ is undefiled. And it's as we continue to be washed in that blood, forgiven of our sins, cleansed from sins that are revealed to us as we grow in Christ, that undefiled, unblemished, spotless blood of Christ continues to cleanse you and I and keeps us from being defiled. Verse 22, since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, again, not perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord abides forever. And this is the word which is preached to you. So that word is preached to us again today through the Holy Spirit. Let's put our living hope into that imperishable word of Christ. and continue to cleanse ourselves from all spot and filth of the flesh as he tells us in second corinthians uh, chapter uh, second corinthians chapter 7 i think he tells us this and i'll close with this word because this is the living word that cleanses us from this defilement that we find in our hearts and in our minds. Second Corinthians chapter 7. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. May the Lord bless you, my dear brothers and sisters, and take this word and refresh us. Give us cause to rejoice greatly in this season of distress, of experiencing various trials, that each one of us would continue to walk in this living hope that he gives us. God bless you.